now. Today is Giving Tuesday, and uh, we need your help to support our next project, the project that Dr. Jin Bingzu from Yale University is going to present today in about 10, 15 minutes. Where I'm going also to give you a full update on all the other projects and labs that we are sponsoring, thanks to your donations. Um, and uh, you are going also, you, are, you will be able also to ask some questions. Uh, if we are not, if we don't have time to answer to your questions, we are going to uh, review them after the, the webinar and publish the answers on our website. So let's start with the updates. Um, first, I would like to dedicate this um, research update to Alan. Alan passed away three months ago. Uh, he was young, 30 years old, and all this because of NF2. He suffered a lot, and he was uh, a big supporter of nf 2 bio solution. My name is Gilles Atlan. I'm the dad of Karen. Karen was diagnosed when she was uh, six years old. She went through several surgeries already. We removed uh, both of her vestibular schwannoma, and as most of the NF2 patients, she has many more tumors. And that's why a few years ago, um, me and many other families got together in 2018, and we created an F2BO solution in order to jumpstart and accelerate novel therapy research to have a long-term therapy for NF2, for NF2, and uh, not only a short-term uh, therapy that postpone the growth of the tumor, but something that will give us really the possibility to live a long life. Uh, and controlling these tumors that are developing in all our body. Um, we, since 2018, we sponsored uh, many different projects. Uh, so you might ask yourself, why? Why so many projects? Why we don't focus on one uh, lab and put all our resources in one lab only? Uh, simply because we have, in fact, different goals in managing this disease. Uh, some patients, their main goal will be to destroy existing tumors. Some patients will need to stop the growth of the tumor, and some patients want to make sure there is no new tumor that will arise. And also, we don't know at the end what's going to work. So uh, we don't put all our eggs in the same basket. We try different therapies, different approach, different techniques, and we hope that one or many of these approach are going to prevail. So these are the different approach that we jump started and support, uh, thanks to your donations. Um, and so these are projects, and we have also tools that we developed. So these are the different projects that I'm going to give an update uh, about. And we also developed three different tools that support these labs, the biobank, a mice model for epidemoma and the, the volumetric, uh, automated volumetric of vestibular schwannoma. Um, again, all these projects uh, were able to, to be uh, launched and, uh, and run thanks to your donation. And uh, since today it's Giving Tuesday, it's a big fundraiser day for us. Uh, please uh, consider to donate. Here we have you have different code bar, code bar that you can. Uh, you can use your phone and scan the code bar that you need. And the code bar on the left is for, um, it's a website where you can donate and it's a US tax, you, you will gain the US tax benefits. You can also donate on Facebook that also work with the US tax benefits. And if you are in any other countries, in one of the countries that you see the flag here, you will also benefit from, from the tax, tax law of your local country. So let's start with the update. Um, I will start with the bacterial immunotherapy. That's the most advanced research that so far we sponsored. Uh, so what it is, um, in this uh, research, Dr. Brenner and Dr. Michalanos uh, created um, genetically modified a bacteria, a strain of salmonella, and uh, injecting them into uh, NF2 tumor, schwannoma tumor. And uh, it appears that it has a huge effect on the tumor. It totally decreased. First, it doesn't 
the tumor stop growing, but also decrease in size. You can see in the graph, the, the black line is the tumor that is growing when you don't inject with that uh, bacteria. But when you inject with different type of bacteria, you can see the red and the green are really uh, decreasing. So this is very, very encouraging. And right now, this, uh, so it has very good results on mice model. And now there is a biotech that has been formed in order to move this research to the clinic to, and prepare a trial. Uh, the goal is really to start a trial next year in 2023. So far, this biotech raised $2 million plus a grant from the NIH. And they successfully registered this, this drug as an orphan drug for USA and uh, Europe. Uh, and now we, they open a new founding round. So if you want to be an individual investor, so this is not a donation, this is really to be an investor, to invest in that biotech and gain share. Uh, you can, uh, if you're interested, you can send me an email and I will send you more information about it. And also uh, Rebecca is going to launch a, a poll right now uh, where you can uh, um, say if you would like, if you are interested in getting more information about uh, the possibility of investing in Mulberry Biotech. So let's take a few uh, minutes for that. And then um, since you are answering to the poll, we have your emails and we can send you more information. We will most likely do a special webinar just for the people that are interested so they can see the team, the Mulberry team, ask all the questions they need and also get uh, more details about how they can invest. Okay, I think we finish with the poll. If you can end the poll. Very good, you can share the results also maybe, uh, Rebecca. Okay, stop sharing. Very good. So this is the, the research that is the most advanced so far. Um, they are preparing the trial. Uh, as you know, econ the economy is not so great these days. So uh, it's not as easy as before to raise funds. Uh, that's why we would be very happy to have individual investors as well, uh, like you. Um, Let's move to the next to the next um, uh, project that uh, we we sponsor the suicide gene therapy. So this suicide gene therapy also emerged from the lab of Dr. Brenner. Here he is using a, a virus, a, a viral um, delivery mechanism to deliver the ASC gene that promotes the death of the tumor cells. So he also got a good, very good results in mice. And now there is another biotech that is moving this approach forward. Currently, they're doing a bridge, a bridge study and to, uh, to uh, prepare the construct and also building a team that will interact with the FDA in order to know what are the requirements of the FDA uh, to run the toxicology study. And they are building the materials that will be needed for a future trial. And also they are working on raising funds. So this is a suicide gene therapy that we sponsored early on as well in 2018. Now we have the gene addition therapy. So gene addition therapy is also using a, a virus, but this is to add, the virus has the ability to reach the cell and this is to add a, a healthy NF2 gene. Because as you know, in NF2, the problem is that the NF2 gene is mutated and it doesn't produce the Merlin protein that is needed in order to control uh, the growth, um, the replication of the cells that create a tumor. So here we jump started this um, research at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, in the lab of Dr. Mayer. It's a lab with a lot of experience in uh, developing gene therapy and bringing gene therapy to the clinic. Some of the first gene therapy drugs emerged from this lab. Um, and um, currently, um, what has been done in this project 
uh, the lab of uh, Dr. Mayer created some new type of cell culture, um, cell culture that are made out of skin cells. So they turn skin cells into Schwann cells, and these Schwann cells uh, then can be turned into uh, tumor cells. So that's very important to have this culture in order to be able to test um, the, the constructs that is being developed. So a viral construct, it was um, created and tested on these cell lines. And it appeared that uh, they increase the production of merlin, the protein. And that's what we want. We want to increase the production of the protein merlin because the NF2 gene that is mutated is not producing it as it should be and it reduced the cell growth in the cell line. So great results in cell line. And now we are starting to see great res good results also in mice, in two different mice models. In one mice model that we genetically, uh, NF2 mutation was created. So in that mice model, um, we see an, an expression of melin, an increase of melin protein. And again, that's what we want. And in another type of mice, the mice that has a graft of a schwannoma tumor, we can see a reduce of the tumor, a reduction of the tumor growth. The analysis are still ongoing currently. And so once we have the, the final results uh, on the, in these models, we will be able to prepare also uh, for trial, but that's, we will have to find, to have a biotech that will raise the funds in order to, pre to prepare the trials. Now, um, the gene, addition therapy that I just talked about is using a virus to access the cell. But there is also other ways to reach the cell um, without using a virus, but with using nanoparticles. And this will be the presentation that Dr. Uh, Zhu, Jianbing Zhu from Yale University is going to show to us. And today we are fundraising for his lab so he can develop this non-viral delivery of the NF2 gene. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Zhang Bing, for joining. I'm going to unshare so you can share your presentation. And once Dr. Zhu will be finishing, I will be continuing with the update on the other projects. Great, so share the screen. Okay, uh, uh, thank you for your uh, uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you here and uh, to introduce our ongoing efforts uh, on development, uh, development of lower therapies uh, for NF2 uh, treatment. So uh, you may notice that you know, here I put a therapies, uh, which means that we are working on uh, several type of uh, therapeutic approaches. Uh, but uh, uh, as Gio mentioned, our major focus has been uh, uh, gene therapy, so uh, particularly non-viral based gene therapy. So what's gene therapy? So gene therapy uh, is based on definition is a techniques for correcting de uh, defective genes responsible uh, for disease development. Uh, for MF2, so uh, specifically, uh, uh, our patients uh, have mutation on NF2 gene. So there's several approach uh, uh, which can be gene separate approach, which can be potentially explored uh, for treatment of genetic disease. So the first one is gene augmentation or gene correction. So, uh, so in this case, uh, one can uh, deliver DNA or mRNA to, you know, uh, to make our uh, human cells and tissue to express the right type of uh, or normal function uh, uh, protein. So in our case, the MF2 uh, marine uh, protein. So the second type called gene suppression. Uh, in this case, uh, one can deliver uh, some genetic materials like srna, srna, or mRNA to suppress uh, uh, certain uh, uh, certain genes. And uh, or uh, one can potentially uh, uh, deliver uh, uh, in a, a CRISPR or, or a ZNF or this type of uh, nucleus for genome editing. So uh, I think uh, right now uh, for NF2, uh, it's my opinion that more uh, uh, attractive to develop gene correction or gene replacement therapy 
uh, which Jia has mentioned already, uh, we already have a team uh, which work on uh, using viral vectors uh, for, uh, for delivering gene replacement therapy. So gene therapy uh, actually is not a, a new concept. So gene therapy was first proposed in 1970s. So you can imagine over 50 years uh, passed already. However, gene therapy is a lot of uh, easy. Gene therapy uh, was first proposed in 1970. So yeah, you can imagine exactly. 50 yeah. years uh, passed already. Was first proposed in 1970. Excuse me. Uh, okay. Yep. However, uh, gene therapy uh, uh, is a lot easy, uh, mainly because delivery gene therapy uh, is a major challenge. So in a, uh, the first gene therapy clinic trial uh, was conducted in 1978. So in our first clinic trial, one patient was killed uh, by viral vectors. You know? So as a result, the FDA realized that safety is a major concern for gene therapy. So this is one of the reasons why uh, gene therapy uh, product uh, was not approved in this country until in you know, 2000, uh, 2017, just a few years ago. So by now, I think uh, we have uh, probably eight uh, gene therapy product approved by, by the FDA for clinical use. So if we uh, check the ongoing gene therapy clinical trials, so uh, uh, we, can, we can see that most gene therapy are still using viral vectors, you know, particularly right now, the AAV-based viral vectors are very popular. So the reason viral vectors are so uh, important or, or widely used in gene therapy clinical trials uh, is because those vectors uh, can deliver gene therapy in high efficiency. So you know, those viruses you know, uh, have been uh, you know, uh, with us for thousand years and the, and, and the virus we are using for gene therapy have been evolved uh, develop a many uh, very you know, uh, uh, intelligent mechanism to invade uh, to invade our, our human cells. You know, for example, you know, the viral particles can penetrate our cell membrane and get into uh, uh, and can deliver their genetic materials into uh, cells and then you know, hijack our human machinery to uh, to express uh, transgenes or their own genes. So you know in in our viral based gene therapy, uh, uh, gene therapy uh, this scenario, we can hijack the viral machinery uh, to express our gene, our interest. Uh, for example, we can express NF2 gene using viral vectors. So, because of the, uh, this viral vectors have high efficiency, so uh, they have been widely used in, in current clinic. However, it's also uh, now that the viral vectors have uh, certain limitations. Uh, so, for example, we know that you know, uh, viral vectors have safety concerns. Uh, because we, you can imagine, right? We, we inject a uh, viral, uh, large virus into our human body. So, potentially, these viral vectors will induce uh, a significant uh, immune response. So, for example, for most gene, uh, viral based gene therapy, is very, it might be very difficult to receive repeat uh, uh, treatment because you, after the first injection, uh, your body will recognize and remember uh, uh, these viral vectors. So in subsequent treatment, your body uh, has developed a mechanism to reject you know, viral-based uh, uh, therapy. So also uh, it's very difficult to produce viral vectors and also uh, uh, the viral vectors, you know, uh, particularly for AAV-based viral vectors, they have uh, limitations in terms of packaging uh, capacity, which means that these vectors uh, cannot be used uh, for delivery of uh, large uh, payloads. You know, uh, of course, right now the civil uh, strategy has been proposed to over overcome these limitations. But, uh, but nevertheless, you know, because the viral vectors have high efficiency, uh, these vectors are still dominantly used in current clinic and the clinical trials. So, you know, just uh, in a, uh, until a few years ago, I think in a, probably two, three years ago, uh, most people still believe, you know, viral vectors you know, are the solution for most genetic disease. But in a, uh, as we know that, you know, uh, uh, the many, not how uh, important uh, events happened just over the past few years in the gene therapy field, uh, particularly with the success of uh, success in, uh, in development of uh, COVID-19 vaccine, uh, I, 
I, I believe that most people here uh, should have received either COVID, uh, either a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. So both of them actually are nanoparticle-based uh, gene therapy. So in this case, the mRNA, uh, which uh, used for express the, the uh, viral protein, uh, was encapsulated into lipid nanoparticles. And then each one received a nanoparticle uh, administration. So the success development of COVID-19 has shown that non-viral therapy uh, is viable. You know, is how shows that you know we can potentially use nanoparticles to uh, 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 for uh, you know efficacious you know, as show here right you know uh, efficacious mRNA delivery and it can produce robust you know uh, uh, vaccine system and uh, how many advantage. But I also know that you know uh, from uh, from this past three years uh, practice and you know, uh, is know that. There are many limitations with current nanoparticle systems. You know, for example, uh, most uh, nanoparticles are unstable. And you know, for example, we know that the you know, Pfizer vaccine or Moderna vaccine need to be stored at a certain uh, freezer, a special freezer, uh, for limited time. You know, because they are unstable, and they cannot produce you know, a long-term gene expression effect, and, uh, and many other limitations. So our group focused on a different type of nanoparticles, uh, which are made of polymers. So uh, different from lipid particles, which are formed uh, by four or five different components. Uh, most of them are lipid. So polymer particles are formed by one single uh, molecule uh, called polymers. So polymers are form, uh, uh, synthesized through covalently uh, conjugate small molecules into large molecules. So polymers uh, actually have been widely used uh, in the gene therapy field. So the first batch of polymers uh, developed for gene therapy actually uh, uh, was can trace back to 1960s. So in a, even in current clinic, meaningful activated gene therapy, uh, a lot of polymers are still being used. But in mo in most cases, PEI, so as a uh, PEI as show here, so the first generation polymers actually can deliver gene very well uh, in, in terms of efficiency. So the major problem is that uh, those polymers have highly uh, toxicity. So those polymers can be utilized for ex vivo gene therapy. Uh, ex vivo means that you know, one can take you know, uh, human cells out of the body and then do a gene transfection uh, in dish that's called ex vivo gene therapy. But those uh, polymers uh, cannot be used for in vivo gene therapy because those polymers are highly positive charge and they can induce significant toxicity. So if we inject these polymers into human body, you know, uh, one can expect a significant side effect. So our group developed a lower approach uh, for synthesizing polymers for gene therapy. Uh, the first batch, first generation polymers was developed over 10 years ago. So you know, as shown here, uh, without going into the details, so we sense on a polymer with three molecules, three small molecules. So uh, and you may appreciate that uh, those polymers do not have a lot of charge. The charge actually most provided by the amino group. So our polymers uh, do not have a lot of charge. So as a result, they do not, do not have a lot of uh, toxicity. However, our polymer have many other components, uh, including hydrophobicity and uh, molecular weight. And also we can control our uh, polymer solidicity, uh, which means that we can tune our chemistry uh, to synthesize polymer either in liquid or solid form. So we started our first generation polymer library. Uh, we found that among, our, uh, among the library, the liquid polymers uh, can form particles, can deliver gene very well. You know, in terms of efficiency, they can deliver uh, in a, a gene in efficiency probably 100 times greater than uh, commercial lipid agents. The problem is that you know, those liquid polymers are unstable. You know, they can form, par form particles, and those particles cannot be lawfulized. Actually, this is similar to currently used lipid particles, you know, as I mentioned, right? So the COVID-19 vaccine, we need to freeze the, this uh, uh, nanoparticle suspension in freezer, in special freezers. So because it cannot be lawfulized, because after lawfulization, it collects. 
uh, collapsed, just like it show here. This particle after lyophilization, lyophilization means that it just extract all uh, water molecule and then make them into powder form. So through this process, this you know uh, liquid polymers, you know uh, cannot uh, uh, li liquid polymer derived particles cannot maintain their uh, nanoparticle form. So there are also some solid polymers, uh, polymers within this library. We try to see if these polymers can be utilized for gene delivery uh, because these solid polymers can form solid particles and they're very stable. So this is actually taken after lyophilization. So you can appreciate that these particles you know, still maintain a very nice uh, spherical morphology. So unfortunately, our solid polymers in our first generation library could not deliver gene well you know, uh, for, for reasons. So over the past few years, uh, we try to develop a lower chemistry you know, uh, for synthesis uh, new generation polymers, which can form solid particles and also deliver genetic materials in high efficiency. So without going into details, so this is uh, uh, what we have done uh, over the past uh, five years. So we tune the chemistry, we synthesize over 300 different polymers, we characterize you know, one by one, and then eventually identify several formulations, for example, one polymer called P60OD. So this polymer can form solid particles, and you know, it can maintain their morphology uh, after lyophilization, and they're very stable. So most importantly, uh, they still uh, maintain high efficiency for gene delivery. So this particle can deliver DNA or RNA materials in efficiency efficiency greater than uh, lipid nanoparticles, uh, either commercial lipofactomy or industry grade uh, lipid nanoparticles. So, you know, typically our particles can deliver genetic materials in efficiency probably uh, close to 20 to 50 times greater than all a commercial or industry grade uh, lipid nanoparticles. So, as I mentioned, uh, the reason we, uh, we the motivation in which we want to develop second generation polymers is because we want to develop a stable nanoparticles. So as shown here, we sense our particles use a microfluidic system. After that, we can simply lyophilize our particles in the powder. So this, is, this is particle very stable. You know, uh, whenever we need to use, we can simply reconstitute our particles with, with staining or, or a uh, cell culture medium. So we found that this uh, lyophilization doesn't reduce delivery efficiency. So we believe the stability is important uh, because imagine in clinic, right, you know, uh, particularly for patient treatment, we may want to have some stable reagents in the which you can just store in a freezer for a long time. You know? So in that case, you know, particularly for those patients in uh, underdeveloped country, right, so you know we can deliver our therapy to our patients you know, easily. So we have been uh, explore uh, our particles for treatment of genetic disease. So one of the disease we have uh, a test is called M1. So uh, for uh, this audience, I think the power M1 is not uh, something uh, unfamiliar to you. In France, also a genetic disease caused by mutation in in gene. So, you know, it's also uh, similar to in 2 uh, This is a, is a, a diverse disease for uh, our patients and the families. So currently the low effective therapy for in France treatment. So, you know, through collaboration with our colleagues, uh, we test our particles for uh, gene therapy uh, for in France. So in this case, we encapsulate in encapsulate in front, uh, genetic materials into our nanoparticles. We test our particles in mice, transgenic mice, uh, transgenic rats. I'm sorry. So those rats, uh, bearing human mutations, can spontaneously form tumors uh, in the breast, uh, in the in the breast area. Now, for example, uh, this specific rats generated two tumors. So we, you know, we inject our particles to, uh, to tumors. So we found that you know, our single injection of our particles can eliminate small tumors and it can significantly shrink large tumors. This is a single treatment. 
So we have test our particles in many tumors, in a, a many rats, and we found in a, 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 this, uh, this finding have been consistent. Uh, so uh, this suggests that this nanoparticle-based gene replacement therapy can be effective for treatment of inf one So today I want to talk about our nanoparticles. Uh, actually, in our lab, uh, uh, in addition to the particles, we have developed several other non-viral gene delivery tools uh, for gene therapy. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, very unique uh, cell penetration antibody. We also have developed a technology called STE. You know, both of them can be also utilized for, uh, for delivery of gene therapy. So through collaboration with several colleagues, uh, we have been testing our gene, non-viral gene therapy techniques for treatment of a variety of disease, including Inf1, Inf2, Angiomon syndrome, H14, Pyrovenia syndrome. So in a, actually our list uh, is growing. So in a, uh, we have made progress, uh, significant progress in a, uh, uh, with some disease, including M5 and, and angioma syndrome. So actually we plan for uh, R&D enabling study and uh, clinical trials for angioma syndrome in the next few years. So uh, for M2, uh, we also try to apply whatever we have in, uh, to help our M2 patients. So in a, a, within our lab, we are testing several different types of therapies at this moment. So in terms of gene therapy, uh, we are testing nanoparticle-based gene replacement therapy. We are also testing the antibody-based gene therapy, uh, gene replacement therapy. We also test the nanoparticle-based uh, pyrophotosis in a, a chemotherapy, uh, also, also you know, uh, could be suicide gene therapy for inf 2 treatment. We also testing nanoparticle-based immunotherapy uh, for NF2 treatment. And also we have uh, developed unique particles which can induce uh, pyrophotosis. In, uh, uh, we also testing these particles for NF2 treatment. So as I mentioned, this, all the studies are ongoing. Uh, we hope you know, we can identify, we can find some of them uh, efficacious for NF2. So then we are focused on VAL2 uh, our, uh, our this, you know, uh, 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 these therapies which are uh, most effective and hopefully uh, you know, we can push our, uh, this low therapy into clinical applications. So of course, you know, uh, all the work uh, uh, was done uh, by members in the lab and uh, also through collaboration with other uh, laboratories. Uh, so for specifically for MF2, uh, Wendy Su is our PhD, PhD, PhD candidate, and uh, she is mainly responsible for our M2 uh, superpedical development. So I also uh, appreciate M2 uh, by solutions to help initiate our M2 program, and also our uh, other, other funding support uh, from, from the NIH and the Gilbert Foundation for our M1 gene therapy work. And I'll stop here. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, I know that we have a, a question session. Uh, I will stay here and uh, if you have questions, let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tazu. Thank you. And uh, don't hesitate to write your questions in the, in the Q&A. You have the little icon Q&A. And uh, we will uh, make sure we answer to your question. If not now, we will answer it after the session. So I'm going to continue with the, the update, the research update. Um, so, so far we, so first I, I'm sorry, we are now broadcasting on Facebook. We broadcast a little bit late on Facebook. On Facebook, we had some uh, technical difficulties. Um, so you missed the first part, you missed uh, the update on the suicide gene therapy on the bacterial immunotherapy gene addition therapy. Uh, but everything is recorded, everything will be on YouTube and we will uh, advertise um, the recording uh, uh, on Facebook and, uh, and through our mailing list. So you will be able to see the whole, the whole recording. So to continue with the other um, project program that we are sponsoring. So we just finished uh, to talk about the project of Dr. Zhu and this is the the lab that now we 
wants to sponsor and we are fundraising for. So thank you again for your support. And now I will be talking about this gene editing pilot that we started a few months ago. Um, it's more like a pilot, a proof of concept to see if this is technically possible to correct the NF2 gene. So here we don't replace the full NF2 gene. We try to correct the one uh, that the patient has. But obviously there is many different type of mutation inside the NF2 gene. So we, won't, we, we took three different type of mutation, a large deletion mutation, a small deletion mutation, and a point mutation. Uh, the first results uh, from Dr. Chernoff's lab at Fox Chase Cancer Research Center is that he technically, he, it was not sure that he could do it, but he succeeded to edit the gene and correct the gene. Uh, in these three types of mutation, he, had, he has to use different technique uh, for the large deletion compared to the small deletion and pump mutation, but he succeeded. Now he's working on increasing the optimization. And the challenge is that the cells that uh, he's using in the culture are, are growing very slowly. Um, and uh, that's uh, make the, the experiment a bit, uh, uh, a bit difficult and challenging. And so we are, it's more like a pilot to see if really this is possible to edit the NF2 gene. Now we have a, um, a research going on for almost a year now in Manchester, UK, and uh, where we focus, we want to understand um, the role of the inflammation in the NF2 tumor. So if the inflammation, uh, how the inflammation in the NF2 tumor is responsible for tumor growth and how we could control this information in order to reduce the growth of, of the tumor. So, so that's what the goal. And so far, uh, the team, Grace and Adam in UK in Manchester, um, discovered that the microenvironment, all the different types of cells that are existing inside an NF2 vestibular schonoma are very, very similar to the vestibular schonoma that are sporadic, that are happening uh, at patients that doesn't have NF2. As you know, uh, anyone can get vestibular schwannoma sporadically, usually in the age of 40, 50 years old, but they just get one, usually on one side. But with NF2, most of the patients are getting it on both sides and early on in their life. And, but the sporadic NF2, uh, the sporadic vestibular schwannoma is way more common, as you can imagine. And so it's way more easier to have access to this tumor and to do a research on it. And also, if we have an, an opportunity for, for a drug, for a treatment, the fact that it could work on also the sporadic vestibular schonoma is very strong, is very important uh, later on for being able to raise the funds to develop uh, a therapy. So we not only target the NF2 population, but we target the larger population, the population that are also getting this sporadic vestibular schonoma. So it's very, that was a very important discovery that they did. And now they would like to find if there is any uh, clinical trial opportunity for existing drugs that could control the, this, uh, uh, the inflammation in the tumor. And so in addition to all these different projects that uh, I presented and I gave an update, there is also three tools that NF2 Biosolution sponsored to develop, tools that are very important and that are needed uh, for advancing, for having these labs working on NF2. First, it is a, a biobank to have access to tissue. So we had to launch an NF2 biobank because if you, we have fresh tissue, to, uh, tumor biopsy, with it, we can create new cell lines and the labs can work on the cell lines. We can create all cell culture that are called tumor organoids as well. And we can also create uh, mice uh, and graft the, the tumor cells, the human tumor cells into mice. And so the mice can develop a tumor. So it's very important to have access to tumors, to NF2 tumors. And as you know, NF2 is uh, quite rare. Uh, so it's important to have NF2 uh, biobank that is accessible to anybody. And with this cell line, with the xenograft mice, with this cell culture, we generate a lot of data that can be shared to any researcher. 
and uh, to advance the research. So that's why it's very important to have a biobank, an F2 biobank. And this is what we did a few years, two years ago in collaboration with Children's Hospital uh, of Philadelphia. We started this uh, biobank focused on NF2 where we collected more than tissues for more than 80 patients, uh, tissues and also blood and saliva. And uh, thanks to this tissue, we could develop also cell culture and organoids and also do a full genome sequencing of uh, 50 trios. So I'm going to talk about it in the next two slides. Um, after we collect all these tissues, uh, we now we are transferring the ownership of the tissue to NF2Bio solution in order to speed up the process of sharing these tissue to other lab and the cell line to other lab. So now we are in the process of, uh, of consenting all the patients that donated the tissue and the new patients as well. And so we can really uh, share them with all the lab in an efficient manner. So if you are interested, if you are going to have a surgery in the future, or if you had a surgery in the past, uh, we will be able to get access to your uh, tissue, to the tumor that is being removed. And with it, we can advance uh, the science. So you can sign up by, uh, by screening the code, uh, the QR code here. And also, um, Rebecca is going to launch a small poll so we can get your information. When you answer to this poll, uh, we will have your email and then we can contact you in the future uh, in order to have you participating in the NF2 Biobank. So let's uh, wait for a minute to give you time to answer to the question. Okay, thank you. You can uh, stop the poll, uh, Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, so another thing that we did with the um, Children Brain Tumor Network at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we succeed to collect 100, more than 150 samples of saliva from parents and their NF2 child, because it was important to have the genome of the parents and the genome of the child that has NF2 in order to compare it, to compare the two. And so thanks to uh, our database of patients, we could do that. And now the data is being received back, the full genome sequencing of uh, these 150 people, it's being analyzed and then it will be displayed uh, uh, without, of course, names, uh, without uh, identification, but uh, the genome data will be shared on the portal so any labs can stu study them and uh, derive some uh, insights from it. Uh, the second tool that we are sponsoring is the development of um, NF2 empedimoma mice. Uh, so sadly, there is no mice model, animal model, that develop any two type of empedimoma. Um, epidemoma that have NF2 mutation because there is other type of epidemoma. And without having a mice, you cannot test all the different therapies that I presented and other therapies and drugs. So maybe a, a drug that is working on a, on a vestibular schonoma, on a schonoma, might work on epidemoma, but we don't know it has not been tested. So the FDA won't let us try uh, as well uh, on human in doing a trial. Uh, so that's a very important uh, uh, model to have. And uh, Professor Calamarides in Paris is developing this mice. Uh, he has some first early results that show that apparently the mice is starting to develop these epidemoma tumors, uh, but the results are still too early and hopefully it will be published soon. A third um, project that we are, tool that we are sponsoring, is the ability to, to automate the volumetric uh, measurement of the vestibular schonoma. As you know, as a patient, you are doing MRI very often and you get a report. And in your report, you have a measurement that is just uh, XY measurement. Uh, but that's not enough to really 
understand and being able to know if your tumor is stable or growing uh, or not, especially if you are taking Avastin, doing a trial of another drug, you really want to know if it has effect. So here's an example of some measurement uh, of a patient. And so on the left side, this is a linear measurement, X, Y. That's usually what you get in your uh, MRI report. And you can see that from between 2016 and 2017 in that MRI report, the patient thinks that his tumor decreased inside or at least stay stable. But if you do the full volumetric measurement, it's increased by 33%. So the patient thought it's stable or it is decreasing, but in fact, it increased by 30%. Here between two, in 2021, it looks like the tumor is stable, but in fact, it grew by 20%. By, by 20%. So it's very important for us, for our patients, to know what's going on with our tumor, if they are stable, or if they are growing, because based on that, we have to take uh, decisions. Uh, so the goal of this project is really to do uh, automated full volumetric uh, study of the tumor so more patients can have the ability to know the volume of the tumor and not just the XY measurement. And here in the photo, you can see that uh, the tumor in, in red is the tumor in 2021. And we can even know which part of the tumor grew. In yellow is the tumor that grew uh, in one year in 2022. And you see the volume here from 1,157, it grew to 1,736, so more than 50% volume. So it's here clearly, you know, the growth rate of the tumor and you can decide the decision, maybe preemptive, uh, uh, proactive decisions, uh, or at least you, you know what's going on with the growth of your tumor. And one of the challenge of all the different projects that I presented is that we as a nonprofit and F2BO solution, we are usually able to finance, to fund the first part of the research, the pilot, the preclinical uh, study, that are the study on the cell line and on the mice. But when we start to get to the first trial, the phase one and the phase zero and phase one, it starts to be very costly. And usually the pharma and the biotechs uh, prefer to get involved later on when, we, when there is less risk, when they already have some results on humans. So there is an area here, a gap, where no, not many people want to invest. And that's what we are and if to be a solution trying to solve, to motivate biotechs to take on um, the research uh, after the preclinical, uh, and also to find ways to raise the funds uh, that are needed in order to launch the trials. Uh, so we are working hard at trying to find uh, ways of doing it. Uh, like what I presented at the beginning about Mulberry, a way for you to invest as an individual investor into the biotech might be also a way to uh, to do this uh, to bridge the the gap of this funding. And so far, since we are existing, all this has been possi possible. All these different research that I presented has been possible thanks to you. And um, here are the example of who is are uh, donating to NF2BO solution in USA, because we have donors from all US, but this is for, from all the world, but here, this is from USA. So most, the biggest donation that we are getting uh, are mostly from NF2 parents and families and friends and patients. And the number of donations are again from NF2 parents, patients and families. So as you see, we, all this has been possible thanks to you, thanks to the patient, and it's very important for us, for the patient, family, and friends, uh, and parents to be involved. Without our involvement, we won't be able to, to move forward. Uh, so please consider to donate and to fund the, the lab, the project of Dr. Zhu that he presented today, so we can have a, a, an approach uh, using his uh, polymeric nanoparticles in order to deliver the healthy NF2 gene. And you have different code bar here for donation. And if you are watching this uh, webinar in the recording, you can also uh, scan these different uh, uh, QR code 
uh, but you will have also the links in the comments. So again, it's all about network. Uh, when we started NS2BL solution, we understood very fast that uh, one of our goal is to connect the patients to the biotechs, to the lab, and to the NF2 expert in order to have this different approach that could have a holistic uh, solution for NF2 for, for NF2 uh, disease. Uh, as you know, we have different goals to achieve and we need different approach and we don't know which approach is going to work uh, at the end. So that's why we have to go in parallel and, uh, and um, launch and fund these different uh, uh, techniques in order to have a solution, a long-term solution for NF2. For NF2. Uh, so thank you again. And if you have any uh, questions, you can email me and we are going to see if we have questions for from the public here. Um, Rebecca, do we have a, do we have a question from your QA? No. Uh, Rebecca, I cannot hear you. No questions right now. No. Oh, okay. Okay. So thank you very much and thank you for your support. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zhu, for your presentation. Thank you. Yes. And uh, have a good day, everybody.